Hey guys, Jim here. Welcome back once again. Today we're going to be taking a look at a beautiful and absolutely gorgeous piece from Eric Oaks. And uh, last time I had a chance to show any Oaks works was about four years ago after I returned from the Blade Show 2014 and had borrowed a handful of his knives and gave you a, a nice little display. And I, I told you at that point that that was the year um, as I was accepting those that I placed my order with Eric for a knife. And here it is. Yeah, it does take a long time. A lot of people say, oh, Jim, and they cry, do the crybaby thing. Oh, Jim gets whatever he wants and he doesn't have to wait and he bumps people out of line. Man, I waited two and a half years, uh, actually three, a little over three years to for my knife to get made after I placed the order. Uh, when I did receive it, um, it was a little bit different than what you're going to be seeing here from inside this uh, zippered case. The uh, knife was just laid out a little bit differently. We had an issue with a couple of the mosaic pins wanting to just fall out. And that's something that, unfortunately, until after the knife has been built and used, that's the only time that you're going to see that issue. So I sent it back to Eric, and he's had it for about a year, and he made some tweaks, and he redid the scales and everything else. So I just got it back. So just about three years wait for it to get built, and then about a year wait to get things kind of corrected. But now the knife is uh, absolutely perfect and absolutely worth the wait. What we're looking at here is his Persian model with what I do believe he calls his Tanto Tip Grind. And that is the uh, polished upswept tip that you have right there. Absolutely gorgeous. And uh, Eric was really great throughout the ordering process. He allowed me to dictate the materials that I wanted and kind of how I wanted it laid out. And at the time... Um, I hadn't seen anybody really do what I was requesting, so I was really excited to have it done. What I wanted to do was Timascus bolsters with uh, vintage Westinghouse scales, and then I wanted to have mosaic pin inlays done into that as well as into the blade. And I'll show you, actually right now is probably the best time. Let me just go ahead and edit in right now a picture of what the knife originally looked like with the layout that I had requested. Now as you see the knife looked really good but it wasn't honestly really really great. Um, so I'm glad that we had the issues that we did because I like this layout a hell of a lot more because the what I hadn't considered was the hardware that was going to be used to hold the bolsters and the scales on and because of their placement it made the placement of the mosaic pins kind of look wonky and it just didn't look as good as it should have so when Eric took it back and redid the scales I said you know what just do whatever you feel is best and we even discussed even going to carbon fiber scales and other stuff like that he says no no I want to I want to keep with the vintage Westinghouse but I'm gonna change the layout just a little bit and it really flows a lot better this way I love the three different pins that are being used here in the S35 VN steel blade. Just gorgeous. Uh, he also redid the Timascus finishing a little bit to bring out some more of the uh, burgundy hues. So it's more of the, uh, the blue purple burgundy instead of the lighter colors that we had before. And you'll notice that he has aged the Westinghouse, uh, kind of a forced aging, so it's definitely more yellow than the originals were. Now, of course, the picture I just showed you was uh, just a crappy iPhone picture, but you get the gist of what, uh, of what it looked like. Let's go over some of the uh, the specs on this just very quickly. I'm not going to belabor this and make it a very long video. Just want to show you the beauty and the artwork that uh, that Eric presents here. You're looking at about nine and a half inches overall, but just under a four inch blade. If you're counting it right from where the bolster ends to the tip, uh, it's just a touch under four inches. But the practical use of the uh, of the blade itself is about uh, 3.8 inches. So you have a good full size, in my opinion, useful ED blade and a knife that quite honestly is too beautiful to really undergo many of your EDC cutting tasks. This is really going to be a showpiece. This is something that when you pull this out and people look at the uh, incredible hand rub satin finish 
and the uh, the mosaic inlays, the beauty of the Timascus and the Westinghouse, uh, the classic look of having the mosaics in there, the backspacer, which is uh, absolutely gorgeous, and you can see if we can get it lined up just right that it is Timascus. And you can see the pattern coming through the edge just a little bit. The titanium liners are a beautiful bronze anodizing, which again, kind of mutes everything, keeps it very classy. Uh, very, uh, very contoured, fancy Timascus pocket clip. Two more of the mosaic inlays. And then again, Timascus for that bolster. There's the other side of the mosaic pins. This is actually easier than uh, people think it is. I've actually done this on a couple of knives that I've made. And it looks really, really, really good if it's done right. And uh, obviously having the high luster finish on the uh, steel allows you to get a, a nice clean look on the mosaics. They look fantastic. I love his grinds. Uh, this, is a, this is an exceptional blade shape. It's a great blade shape overall. And then, you know, his sweeping plunges... Coming up here to this uh, very, very stout convex ground tip, which has been polished. And then this swedge, this top clip that comes in about uh, the last third of the blade, really. It's not really quite the halfway mark, but the last third of the blade. And it creates a uh, beautiful diamond right there at the tip. And you'll notice the tip is not fragile at all. It's a nice, full supported tip. And then with that convex grind on there, that's giving you quite a bit of support too. So this is not going to be a delicate knife by any stretch of the imagination. But just by the beauty of it, uh, you kind of keep the idea that it's somewhat fragile. You know, at least that you're going to be babying it, not that it's necessarily fragile. The action uh, is fantastic. Get it past that detent and it just drops right into place. Very smooth, very fast. Take a look at the lock up here, which I actually never even bothered to look at. Um, yeah, it's still pretty early lock up, but it's uh, obviously very, very solid. It's done a, a part of my fingers falling apart here. This is what happens when you make knives for a living. So my hands don't look as uh, camera ready as they used to. But that's just the way it is. That's uh, what you have to live with. You'll see it is a floating backspacer. Really nicely done. And all the materials are made up very, very well. Everything is very smooth, very clean, almost undetectable from material to material. Very, very well done. And the great thing about Eric is the fact that uh, all of his knives are truly handmade. These are not, uh, and, and again, this is not to bash anybody that uses CNC or water jet or EDM or any of that stuff because um, they're, they, they're, those all serve a very important purpose in the world of knife making. Uh, however, there are times that you specifically want a handmade knife, everything done by hand. And uh, if you're in that mood, Eric Oaks is a great way to go. Now, yes, it is a long wait, but honestly, I mean, any good maker is going to be between two and five years wait. That's just the way it is. Uh, and the, you know, usually the best of the best don't even, you know, they don't, they don't even have open books. You can't order from them anyway. And it's surprising that you're able to still order from Eric. And now, I don't know that you can now. I don't want to say that and, and get myself in trouble because you email him and, oh, Jim said you're taking orders. And it turns out that maybe he isn't. I don't know. So don't take my word for that. Again, I ordered this uh, almost, you know, four years ago. So it has been quite a while. In that four years, things may have changed. I know a lot of makers now don't even take orders. They just prefer to make what they're going to make and then make it available in some fashion uh, because it kind of takes that monkey off your back. You're not a slave to your books, and it allows you to be more creative and work on more new projects. But uh, this, I just want to make sure we got a chance to get this out and let people see it because I put up a few pictures the other day on Instagram, uh, the ones that you saw at the beginning of the video here, and uh, people just went nuts. They went, where's the video? I want to see it. I want to learn about it. What the hell's going on? So here you go. Uh, one of the things that I do like, even though I'm not a fan of having all this exposed hardware, that really is the classic way of making a knife, guys. I, you know, a lot of times we get hung up on seeing these really high-end, really prestigious knives that have all hidden hardware, 
and people have just begun to think, well, that's the way all knives should be. No, that is a high-end option that you pay a lot of extra money for, and very few makers even do that. So don't be distracted by that, but since it does have the exposed hardware, I'm very glad that it's a hidden pivot style bolster um, because it does clean things up a little bit. You don't have that extra piece of hardware sticking out on both sides, and you can see the beauty of just the, uh, the Timascus bolsters. Overall, as far as the ergonomics and the shape, it's a really, really nice shape. For me, it's a little bit cramped. Uh, I've discussed this a million times. I wear a size large glove. That's the size of my hand. And between this choil, the guard that the flipper creates, and uh, the tail section of the handle, it's a tiny bit cramped for me. I actually have to kind of squeeze my fingers together to get in there. Uh, so as you see, it's a little bit tight. But honestly, uh, you shift your grip to this instead of this and all of that goes away so that's completely a non-issue for me it feels really nice everything is nicely contoured while the scales and the bolsters are completely flat he is contoured and radius all of the edges there isn't a sharp edge anywhere on the knife except for the blade edge and a little bit right in here um, on the back side of the uh, the liner lock now he's contoured it here, so that's where your thumb is actually engaging it, but if your thumb gets pinched between the liner lock and the bolster, um, yeah, and that's actually what started bringing this up. It was My thumb was already torn up, but now it's exaggerated it. So there's that. I do like the flipper tab. I typically don't like large flipper tabs that are angled so far forward. However, the way that he's done this is really, really nice. All the edges are rounded. Uh, it's not very sharp in any particular area. And because of that hook shape that it's got, it doesn't require jimping on the front face of the flipper tab, which you guys know is something that I prefer. But it's not necessary here because your finger's never going to slide off of it. You could choose to light switch it if you like. As you see, it works just fine. Or you can push button it. Push buttoning it, and it's probably going to open it a little bit faster, a little bit more authority behind it, but it works in every possible way. The overall flow of this knife is beautiful. Uh, it's got a nice organic feel to it. There are no you know, straight, harsh edges or corners anywhere on it. It's a very clean design, very aesthetically pleasing, and uh, feels very good in the hand. To see stuff like that, uh, that nice polish on the tip, really adds a little bit of extra pop to it. I know it's really hard for my camera to focus on all these shiny things. Beautiful hand rub satin and one of the nice things that you'll notice is he has not softened the lines between his flats and his bevels by doing the hand rub because he's doing it right. He's not rolling over as he's doing his hand rub. He is very strategically doing his flats and doing his bevels, going back to his flats and keeping all of this very, very sharp. So you can see all of the, the intricate grinds that he's done here very, very cleanly. That's uh, very, very well done. His sweeping plunge is absolutely gorgeous. It is perfectly executed. And that is where it goes from the full thickness of the blade and sweeps in gently to the cutting edge. Instead of having a very harsh uh, plunge right here, it's a very soft a uh, little scoop inwards. I love a sweeping plunge. Execution on all the materials is fantastic. Um, I see no glaring errors with anything. Now again, uh, when I first got it, um, the smaller mosaics that we had back here on this side um, fell out. One, one fell out, and I think I even lost it. <laughs> it could be somewhere in my carpeting still. Um, although I think I was able to press it back in. I don't remember. But uh, that was one issue, and there was a little issue with the tip grind, and that was very, very minor. It's something I could have touched up, but the same thing I told him. I didn't build the knife. I don't feel I have the right to go touching up somebody else's work because, I mean, God forbid I screwed it up, and then, you know, I sold it a year or two later, and then it goes through three or four more hands. People don't know the story, and then somebody sees a screwed up grind on a knife that has his name on it. That's not good. That's why a lot of us don't like... Uh, knife pimpers or modifiers because you know people don't know the story as it may change hands throughout the years and if that pimper or modifier has done something that uh, ruins the integrity of the knife in some way somebody down the line won't know that it wasn't the original maker that did that so 
you know, if, if you've got a custom knife and you want something else done to it, send it back to the person that made the knife. That is the best possible way to uh, maintain the integrity uh, of the knife and of the, uh, the knife maker's brand. So uh, enough on that subject right there. But anyway, I'm going to cut this off really short. I just want to make sure that you guys got a chance to see this up close and personal. I don't get a chance to really do a lot of videos. And uh, yes, this is rushed because I just don't really have the time for it. But I want to make sure that I got it done today. Uh, I'm on my blade show push. I'm trying to crank out 20 knives in the next, well, I've already got a few of them made, but I'm trying to crank out 20 to take with me. I'll be at booth 71. Please come by and see me. It'd be great to meet some of you guys and you get a chance to handle my knives, put them in your hand and uh, judge them for yourselves instead of just looking at pictures on the internet. So it's, you know, it's that time of year where I, I may not get another video done until after I get back from Blade. But uh, I've got a lot of cool stuff I still want to share with you guys that I've really, really been enjoying. Got a couple of new Zebas up on deck. Um, just some really, really fantastic stuff. So I'm going to do my best to make the time so that you can actually get a chance to, uh, to experience those along with me. But for right now, this is the uh, Eric Oaks Persian. And that is it for me. I'm out of here, and I'll see you guys on the next video.